Hello, everybody. We are live. It is John Pollock here for Rewind to Dynamite. And joining me tonight, sitting in Wei Ting's shoes tonight, he is the one and only John Sino. John, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, despite all day long getting hazed by Braden and Davey calling me a traitor, saying, how dare you be on our Wednesday night war opposed team over here for the night. And I told them, you know, it's just business. You know, contract negotiations came up and uh, they weren't paying attention. Well, you so, know, I, I don't want to I don't want to like uh, tell tales out of school, but I mean, over there at Up Next, I mean, their grand plans for John Cena was to just like be a manager. You know what I mean? <laughs> be like a second fiddle. And here we're putting you on the big show here. I mean, we, we have big plans for you. So here you are, John. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, they, they wanted me to manage them. Um, dicky bird over there and i was just like i don't know if that's gonna cut it for me so it's just like how much you've done everything there you want to you want to come over to AEW? so here here you are here I am. a lot to uh discuss uh with you tonight uh i want to get some of your thoughts because you were actually in attendance uh, at smackdown last friday and i thought it'd be interesting uh for listeners to get your live uh perspective but off the top i do want to make mention to everybody that the g1 contest is open now you can submit your picks john have you put your picks in I haven't. I need to do that. I definitely need to do that. Well, you can do so until Friday night at midnight Eastern. Postwrestling.com forward slash G1. Free to enter. You make your picks for every single one of the G1 matches. Uh, We have a media roundtable up on the site today with Alan Forel, Benno, and Rich Krejci from Voices of Wrestling giving their thoughts on the G1 Climax. And tomorrow, Thursday on the site, Bruce Lord is going to have a whole preview of the B Block because Bruce and Mark Buckley are going to have you covered with reports throughout the G1. We'll be doing our G1 podcast throughout the next month. It's going to be very crazy. But get your picks in. Friday night at midnight is the deadline uh, for you to go uh, join all of that. And lots of shows up on the site. On Thursday, WH Park is going to be joined by Scrump and Stank from the PWT cast to chat the latest edition of what if uh, have you, have you watched this week's edition, John of what if? I, it, I haven't watched this week's. I'm still catching up. I still have to watch last week's and uh, today's, but I'm definitely enjoying the show. Definitely a lot going on on the show. Okay. I was uh, going to get a tease there. If this is a really good episode or not, but we'll just assume it is regardless. Yeah. You're going to get WH scrump and stank and then rewind to SmackDown Friday night. We're live for all patrons, 10, 15, actually, 1115 Eastern because we're just adding more and more hours on Friday nights. We will get into that later. <laughs> Kate from Montreal will be joining me this Friday night. And then it's into the weekend. We will have G1 shows for cafe members Saturday and Sunday, Sunday, the big return of waiting. I'm going to start the podcast. Rosario Dawson is going to be here and way is going to come down the aisle in a bright red suit that he bought in Cancun and, and get into it. So look forward to that this coming weekend. It's the G1 podcast begin and uh, our lives are over until at least October 21st. All of that can be found postwrestling.com. Lots of great uh, stories, news items, and more to come. But John, how are you tonight? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm, I was actually supposed to go to this show in Newark uh, way back when it was supposed to be Blood and Guts. And uh, I had my tickets and everything. And Cody Rhodes even promised me that, don't worry, we have a treat for you. Come to find out the treat was his red suit. Um, but I went ahead and made the right decision. I said, you know, what? I'm going to get a refund and I'm just going to go to Queens instead, which um, feels like the right choice. I think after tonight, that's a pretty solid investment. If you had tickets for next week and we're wondering what caliber of show you're getting, it's a pretty high one. And Pretty noteworthy, the fact they will be doing two hours of Dynamite and two hours of Rampage next week. So we've got a four-hour marathon next next Friday. But uh, just in terms of like a live show, John, like it is a pretty stacked uh, card you have between both episodes that they're taping next Wednesday. Absolutely. And don't forget from 7 to 8, I'm pretty sure they're going to tape uh, an hour of Elevation. I know they're still doing those in front of Dynamite, so I'll be able to get a head start on, on my show. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a big night. I didn't expect them to do two hours of Rampage, so... Um, that kind of changes plans a little bit. I know it's, it might be kind of hard for some people 
to get it. Because by the time the show's over, it's going to be, I'm guessing, what, 11, 30, 12? Maybe without the commercials, it might be less than two hours for Rampage. But um, it definitely feels like a pay-per-view, pay-per-view caliber type of show. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into it. But the big news is that they are going to do Kenny Omega and Brian Danielson on Wednesday and then CM Punk wrestling on the Friday. Uh, were you surprised they went in this direction with Omega and Danielson for a week, uh, a week from tonight? I did, especially like when they did the promo, we'll get into it, but like they didn't really hammer on the promo that was going to be on that dynamite. So I, I thought it was going to be for full gear the way that they kind of like left it up in the air. I'm like, okay, it's not going to happen. And then they kind of hit us with the graphic um, in the next segment. I was, I was a little surprised, but then again, like they definitely want to treat this show like one of the biggest shows ever, obviously with the attendance there. Uh, so take us back to last Friday. You were, you were at the garden. It was a pretty hot edition of SmackDown. Uh, it, it did very well over 2.3 million viewers uh, and an enormous gate as well at the garden. So uh, just, just being in the building for that show, this would be your, your first WWE show back. Um, tell me about that because you, you have the interesting comparison of, you know, you were at all out and then going to this, like that, that sounded like a great crowd on Friday. Yeah, the crowd was great. I mean, first of all, getting into the building, it was my first event just wrestling aside where I had to actually show like my vaccination card right. and my ID going in. And I, I saw a lot of people that didn't know that. So they literally got stopped at the door and had to turn back around. Uh, I hope that's not going to be the same issue in Queens because they're going to do the same thing there. I'm guessing with the vaccination card checks. So that was like a big uh, change because the shows that I went to with uh, Northeast Wrestling and MLW, there was no sort of vaccination policy. So it was the first time I'd, I had that. Um, as far as the crowd, the crowd was great. All night long, uh, Brock Lesnar got a huge reaction. Um, obviously, Finn, Finn Balor with the Demon was, was a big reaction, but they were hot, like, from everything, up and down, uh, except for the NXT commercial, which I know you, you mentioned a couple of days ago. That was, like, the only real thing that got, like, negativity on the show. Um, but other than that, it was a great crowd. Obviously, New York was missed, the first show in New York, so they're definitely missing that, um, just wrestling in general, and I'm pretty sure that's going to carry on to next week. What are you looking at in terms of your next WWE show you go to? Are you looking at Survivor Series? Will you, will you go to that? Yeah, definitely Survivor Series, especially with the rumors of it being, what, the um, 25th anniversary with The Rock. Um, so I'm guessing they might do something with that, maybe even having this in the building. But I'm definitely looking forward to do uh, bar plays for Survivor Series. Yep. And so you have, you have lined them up. You have got All Out, a pretty hot edition of SmackDown. You're going to go to Arthur Ashe Stadium, Survivor Series. Is there anything else in the pipeline for you? There's a lot. I was actually looking today at the um, New Japan show in Philly, and they know they added like Chris Dickinson and Suzuki and Alex Zane against Will Ospreay. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, they're gonna have a lot of shows there between that and uh, MLW. But I think I might lean towards New Japan because I definitely want to catch one of these strong shows live. It's been one of my favorite shows I've been watching weekly. Even the the, the MLW show coming up in a f- in a few weeks, the Fightland one, like between like the Jacob Batu Alex Hammerstone, that's the match they've been building up for like a year. Uh, and then they just announced the, the four-way today for the middleweight title. And the Opera Cup, like, yeah. what an interesting set of participants that they have put in it. Like, they're doing the quarterfinals and semifinals that night. Uh, you're going to get some dynamite matches out of that that tournament. Yeah, they got Bobby Fish. Alex Shelley was announced. I know Lee Moriarty. I'm, I was surprised they, they're, I guess, Tony Khan's allowing him to complete his obligations. But um, I'm happy that he's going to be on the show as well. So, yeah, the Opera Cup is pretty stacked this year. I actually attended the Opera Cup uh, two years ago when it was – David Hart Smith winning. It was a pretty cool concept to see like a, a one night tournament is always kind of a cool thing. Well, let's chat uh, first a bit about NXT 2.0 from Tuesday night. And of course this show was largely built around the introduction of a lot of new names, uh, six new acts that were introduced and of note of those six, all under the age of 30 and all, you know, relatively young in their career, some very young in their careers, but, uh, We'll get into the actual numbers that NXT did, but this was a show that, you know, it did its best numbers since April. I think it was a combination. I think number one was the curiosity on what this concept was going to be and and feel like, but you also had the wedding and you also had the promise of a new NXT champion being crowned. So your first night in of seeing this, this new NXT and it very much feels like it's a new NXT. This is a delineation point from the black and gold era, if you want to call it that. Uh, first impressions, John. Yeah, I mean, all night long, obviously, they were hammering the 2.0, 2.0, but I feel like it was kind of like 1.5. I'm not sure if they were just kind of finishing up loose ends with the wedding and like some of the other stuff that they were doing, but I feel like it was a combination of the new wrestlers 
and the old wrestlers. So I'm not sure if it's going to keep that formula going forward or if they just kind of did that just to kind of like not leave any loose ends. Um, but I was very mixed in the show. A lot of things I enjoyed about it. A lot of things I kind of like was scratching my head about. Um, I have to admit, um, Braun Breaker, I, I hate the name, but I was really impressed with him. Uh, he was probably one of the standouts. Uh, even um, Cal Bloom, one of Von, Von Wagner, he for this position that he was put in, it was pretty impressive to be in there in a, in a main event, Fatal 4-Way, your first match on TV, and to kind of like show and prove like that. Um, I had a question about Braun Breaker because they had co- they had trademarked the name Rex Steiner. Do you think it might be like a conflict with the Steiner name? Maybe they couldn't use it, and that was kind of like a last-minute change to this new Braun Breaker name? I don't know what the what the reasoning was. Certainly, I thought Rex Steiner was actually, that's like a pretty good name to, to go with. Um I, I don't really enjoy Braun Breaker. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's going to be an ironic uh, love of this name. It's really goofy to me. Um, but this is also a character that you can certainly see, like just from uh, the, the inflections of him and his delivery. Like if you didn't recognize the name, just hearing this guy, you're thinking this, is, this has got to be Rick Steiner's son, like very similar in that delivery. Um, and yeah, to your point, like him and Von Wagner, also not a great name. <laughs> like those were the two to me that you could see like right down to Braun Breaker uh, getting the showdown with, with Ciampa going over LA night. I mean, that's clear that they are going hard with him, but with Vaughn Wagner, like he got the big spot at the end, like laying out LA night. And then it's Ciampa that takes him out, but Wagner had the match won. So in theory, Ciampa has matches set up with both of them. And that kind of feels what this NXT is going to be. It's going to be about these new acts working with your established veterans but the focus this is like a um like pick your your spin-off series where it's like the next generation it's like you bring in the like the 90210 uh revamp mm-hmm. when they brought the old characters in with the hope that it would get all the kids over but that's sometimes easier said than done like rick steiner's son uh bronson rex steiner this guy had his first match less than a year ago and he's being thrown in there so it's um, it's throwing a lot of these guys into the deep end, but you certainly get a sense like what this show is and what it is not. Absolutely. Now, a lot of these people, who knows how much like time they even had to prepare for this. Like, I've heard rumors that it was like the script was being rewritten. They weren't sure what was going to happen, who was going to go on. They might have just found out that day of. I know Trick Williams was getting a lot of like flack, I guess, for his promo. And I mean, for his first time on TV, I think he did okay. He actually gave me like Tyrese from Too Fast, Too Furious vibes with like his whole style and everything. Um, but I feel like it's it's their first night. You can't really like give these guys too much flack. But I think for the most part, like Rex Steiner and um, Von Wagner definitely impressed me the most. Um, but yeah, for the first time on TV, I think they did pretty decent. So the show did 770,000 viewers, uh, 0.21 in the 18 to 49 demo. So both their highest numbers going all the way back to April. And for all those factors, I mean, right across the board, they were up huge in every single demo. Like they, they doubled their 18 to 34 audience. Like everything was up significantly. Obviously it is with the curiosity. Now that people have sat and watched this, um, what they're going to hold. Like, I don't see it staying at this level, but do you uh, like just looking at the, the former NXT levels, like our, are large audiences going to be watching um, developmental projects, which is my biggest takeaway from the show is what this is going to be about. It's like, here is a lot of names. We introduced all of them at once for you. And that's what the show is. Those are going to be the main players. Yeah, definitely think it was just like kind of like that um, curiosity on the first show that got the, the rating so high. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's going to feel more like developmental. You even had a Christian Cage kind of throw a shot at it today, calling it developmental. So I feel like it's going to get a big drop next week. But I feel like some things that they had definitely could work. Um, I was very, I didn't mention it before, but I was really impressed with the new look for Mandy Rose. I feel like things like that might get viewers to come back. The wedding itself that they promote on social media week, uh, all week that, you know, we're going to have footage of the honeymoon. You know, they might, uh, they might, uh, kind of crash into way in Pauline in Mexico. You never know. So what, I about, like, what about Tony D'Angelo? What did you think of Tony D'Angelo? Oh, me being a full blooded Italian myself, I'm very conflicted about it, but I'm also very excited for this uh, Sopranos prequel that's coming out the many saints of Newark. So it kind of got me like all excited, like, yes, Tony D'Angelo finally representing for, for my people. Um, but uh, 
I don't know. I have to see how he is in the ring. I looked him up a little bit. I know he has some like college uh, wrestling experience, but a lot of people were giving him flack as well. But it's like, it, it brought me back to like early, like 2004, 2005 SmackDown, where it was like all these like random promos and wrestlers being introduced. Um, it's still too early to tell, but from what I saw, I've, I've enjoyed uh, Tony D'Angelo. Just made me laugh, made me chuckle. Yeah, I, I would say my biggest uh, criticisms were, I, I thought that it was, like you were trying to really get this theme across of all these new characters, but I think it's very tough when you introduce so many of them that by the end of the two hours, number one, the big thing going off the air is a new champion. And then you're supposed to remember all these different characters that you introduced um, with, with, with the whole deal with introducing uh Braun breaker was okay, fine. You want to introduce this guy in a big way where he beats LA Knight. Cool. Shouldn't this guy have gotten into the main event instead of the dude that just wanders into the room uh, <laughs> after with, with Von Wagner? It just seemed like just logically. And I thought like they were going out of their way to really downplay Samoa Joe. Like there was, it's not like, like right off the top of the show, breaking news, our champion that's relinquished the title. It was like this small thing. And then Vic Joseph just mentions it like almost in passing in commentary before the, the main event. It's like, if you're just a viewer that's not following this, you would have just had whiplash watching the show on Wednesday. It, it felt like if you're somehow not following all this, what a what a shock this show would have been to you. A shock to the system, John. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like when Breaker beat LA Knight, I'm like, okay, well, they're going to put him in the match. Obviously, he got the win. It makes sense, right? Now we get this other guy that comes in. And as soon as I saw Juan Wagner, I'm like, this guy's going to get the title. I really, I kept thinking to myself, like, they're going to put the title on this guy and, and people are going to hate it. But I was actually surprised they put it on Champa. He was probably like my least person i thought was going to win i thought it was going to originally be Pete dunn and i was thinking maybe it could be ellie knight it could be kyle o'reilly i didn't expect um Ciampa to come in and win so i was very very surprised by that yeah what, what kind of role are you expecting to see with like your core guys like Ciampa? Ciampa feels like he's literally assuming the role of samoa joe like the the veteran presence in the locker room that is there to have matches with the the younger guys coming up that I'm sure that like, it just seems like he is just continuing whatever Joe was doing. And then you've got like Gargano, Pete Dunn, Kyle O'Reilly, like that core, are they just, just there to, to work with the younger talent? Do you see bigger things for like those, those four key guys? Yeah, no, for sure. Especially with um, Ciampa. I know back when I was going to the Evolve shows and that's when they were working with NXT and, and Ciampa would always kind of show up to the shows in Queens and he would always be kind of like in the back kind of scouting everybody. One time he even like, just conversated with me to ask me what I thought about certain wrestlers. So he definitely had his eyes on all these talents. Uh, so I could definitely see him have that role overall um, of being like a coach slash wrestler and then kind of transitioning to, to backstage. That could be like the plan for the future to have guys like Gargano and Ciampa just kind of be backstage training all these new, uh, you know, Braun Breakers and Mon Wagners. Yeah. W- one little thing, and it was, it was very minor. I like the fact that they, at a point in the broadcast actually addressed edges attack on smackdown with beth yes. phoenix like it's not like this world exists unto itself like here is a real uh, in wwe real situation uh and asking beth about it like th- i just like the fact that there was that kind of attention to detail for for something with one of your main broadcasters no i did catch that that actually was a good detail because you can't just ignore that and you know, obviously everybody knows these guys are married so why you can't just ignore that on a show like this yeah, so I, I think that this is a show that over time, I, I think this is going to be less of a priority for people watching it. It it truly does feel like the NXT of you know, t- 2013, 2012, like back when, you know, this thing was just kind of developing and it's it's creating characters that are clearly being designed to get to the main roster and where are your more established names? What are their roles going to be? Is this kind of it for them in the system? It, do they have that same trajectory to the main roster? And, and which of these projects are going to uh, become finished products? I mean, that's kind of the intrigue of watching this show, but I mean, the days of it kind of being your, you know, your, your hot answer to, super indies or such like that like that does feel like they've cooled it down and i mean what's your what's your takeover strategy like i don't i don't know how well received like a takeover would be if like it just contradicts kind of what this is where you want to showcase these these younger talents but you put them on a takeover i think that's competing uh objectives with what your audience now expects out of that brand that is takeover that was established for all those years 
Yeah, there's no way they can do TakeOver the same way they did it before. They might as well, if they're going to have specials, they might as well call it something else. Have it like your Halloween Havoc, have your Great American Bashes. But in order to like have that TakeOver name without like a lot of these talents, it's not going to work. Do you think with the draft coming up, I can see somebody like an LA Knight going to a SmackDown. Do you think you're going to possibly move some of the, the older guard up? I, I This year, certainly. I, I think you have to look at the likes of an LA Knight. I'm curious about a Raquel Gonzalez. Um she, she's another one that, I mean, I think she is pretty close to main roster ready. Um, the, the draft is going to be very interesting to see if any of that NXT talent is utilized there. Even uh, a Pete Dunn as well. Like, yes, he's positioned as a, as a strong heel, but um, now that he's locked up, is are they looking at utilizing him elsewhere? Because it, it's not like he's a guy that, I mean, age is on his side. So where where is he best suited? What What is his best role now that we have a long-term agreement with him? And you've had like a handful of names that have been doing all these dark matches like Dakota Kai, Zia Lee. I'm pretty sure they're going to be probably moving up officially. Yeah. And what happened to Damian Priest? Yeah, he was there and he said Didn't he wasn't there for the wedding. Well, he said he wasn't there for the wedding. He said he was there for the bar. So he probably just stayed backstage and was drinking, I'm guessing. Or went back oh. into the, the, uh, the hot tub, possibly. There's probably just waiting for him in the back. That's pretty rude. <laughs> Quite, quite a travel just for an open bar, but yeah, there we go. Uh, Raw on Monday night, they did 1,670,000 viewers, a uh, 0.43 in the demo. This was their first week this season going against Monday night football, which was a beast with the Ravens playing the Raiders and across ABC, ESPN and ESPN2 uh, doing about 15.3 million viewers. And this was not a case where it was a blowout either. And you had kind of that you know, fourth quarter, the game is a blow away and people are tuning out. This was a pretty hot game and Raw combated it with a pretty big episode of Raw. And on the surface, you look at these numbers and they they took a big hit um, in their demo, in their audience. But when you break down the hours, I mean, this is pretty impressive. The fact that they grew in every demo throughout the show uh, with the exception of over 50. Everything else... Um, grew in that third hour. And I attribute that to a rare championship match being on TV and also the big ETs like this third hour. Um, you know, you, you did, there was certainly a silver lining to the ratings pattern here, even though the overall number um, it, it was hit worse than I thought they were down 10% this week uh, and down 18% in 18 to 49 from last week. So those were, those are big hits that they took. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't unless you were on Twitter, there was no way of you really knowing this. It should have, you know, obviously they probably came up with the idea like the day of with changing the matches around and everything. But if they would have definitely hit this home like the week prior with having him come on Raw or even end the show, just kind of teasing it, I think it definitely would have because he said like a throwaway line on SmackDown, but nobody really caught that. So unless like you were on Twitter the Monday of, you definitely wouldn't have heard this. I'm just really intrigued on what next week's episode is going to do as well as SmackDown. I'm not sure if Biggie's is going to be on it, but I know he's already advertised for like the Raws that are coming up. Um, so but I'm really intrigued to see how they're going to do now that he is champion and all the buzz with him. What would you like to see? Do you just do the Lashley rematch at, at the pay-per-view? Um, yeah, I would do a straight up rematch just to kind of give him a little bit more, uh, more, you know, more of a win over Lashley. Cause I know Lashley was kind of like teasing. He was injured a little bit. So some people were like, oh, maybe he didn't really win through, um, straight up. And then obviously I want to see the Goldberg match. I don't know when that's going to happen. I'm going to do Lashley and Goldberg first at the Saudi show. And then eventually do Lashley and I'm sorry, uh, Biggie and Goldberg, but I know Biggie wants that match. He's been talking about Goldberg being his favorite wrestler growing up and he that's his one dream match. So I definitely hope that they do that for his sake. They, they should team up first. Like that should be the, t- the team is Goldberg and Biggie against Lashley and MVP. I Ooh, think that's okay. a great way that that helps Biggie. It puts the title in a big program and Biggie gets something out of Goldberg and you could do that match uh, and maybe you save it for something else. But I like the idea of those two teaming. I think they've got something really big in Big E. Uh, I just think that this was a great move to make. It was sudden. It's not like this was built up, uh, but here we are. And this is, this is a character that people, they want to see in this role. They want to see this guy succeed. And there's a lot of interesting things you can do. Raw desperately needs some kind of shot in the arm. And whether it's, I mean, you, the the obvious one people were looking at is something with the bloodline down the road with the with the new day. Uh, but I like the idea uh, that Big E actually threw out about like Lashley getting back together with Benjamin and Cedric Alexander and rehab the hurt business. Like there, there's a lot you can do on 
on, on that side of things. And I just think raw for, for a long time, they, they have needed something to really get people's uh, excitement going. Like, I think this is a rare edition of raw next Monday that people are very intrigued to see the follow-up to all of this. Right. I think another reason why they might've given him the title or just cashed it in general is because didn't they move up the money in the bank show? Like it's earlier than usual. They're going to have it at Allegiant stadium. So I feel like they might've kind of gotten rid of the idea of the briefcases just to kind of start the hype for the next money in the bank, which is sooner than it usually is. Yeah, that's uh, that's very ambitious running money in the bank in a stadium, but that's obviously the level of show that they're positioning money in the bank to to be at next year. And I I think it's a show that um, it's it's going to tell you about like that Vegas market and running it, whether it's a Friday or Saturday night pay per view. Probably will, will have to be a Saturday night mm-hmm. pay per view that you know Nick Khan kind of outlined when they run Vegas. Like it's you saw it firsthand this year with SummerSlam the success they found running on Saturday as opposed to the traditional Sunday night. All of your news can be found up at postwrestling.com. We are going to get into Dynamite tonight from the Prudential Center, which, as John mentioned, this was originally earmarked for the first Blood and Guts in March of 2020. And that was going to happen two weeks after the pandemic really took hold of everybody's lives. And this was one of the very first shows that ended up getting postponed indefinitely and indefinitely turned into 18 months later. What was the process like of just uh, getting your your tickets refunded? So, I mean, they kept pushing it back and they always gave me the option. Like you could either hang on to your tickets or you can get a refund. And the first, like they changed the date like twice or three times at least. And the first couple of times I was just like, I'm just going to hold on to it, hold on to it. But then a couple of months ago, I'm just like, you know what? Let me get the refund now while I can. Once they announced the Queen show, that's when I was like, all right, there's no real reason for me to go to two back-to-back shows especially with the queen show being a lot bigger so that's when i went ahead and just did the refund and there was no issues i just went ahead and gave him the refund the optional was always there so it never really was like an issue for that so the number they announced on tv was thirteen thousand one hundred ninety-one. uh the prudential center even putting out a tweet that the show sold out so this was uh at least for this week we can say this was the third largest attendance in aew history uh, which will quickly become the fourth uh, once next week uh, shatters all previous records. And you can say you were at two of the four. Yeah. <laughs> Jim Ross, Tony Schiavone, and Excalibur, the now married Excalibur, were on commentary. And out comes CM Punk. Giant reaction here. Dude, this crowd, there were moments on this show where it was just, it was deafening, dude. And we, we say that word a lot. Like there were times I literally had to be turning up my volume because it was so hard to hear the commentary and some of the pops were just insane. Like this was 12, 13,000 people that sounded like 30 at times. No, it was great. Then you had like the uh, guy dressed up as Dusty Rose in the front row. Oh my row. God, that was yeah, amazing. that dude. Yeah. And, and even just seeing some of the faces in the front row, it's a lot of like familiars that I would see, like go to a lot of indie shows in New York. So it was kind of cool to see like people that I would talk to and run into in New York, just kind of being there front and center, but it was a great crowd. Was um, Rosario Dawson there at some of the indie shows you'd go to? Was she an Evolve fan? No, no. Maybe she might've went to PWG with her, uh, with some of her Hollywood friends, but definitely not at Evolve. So Punk does his, uh, his dive into the crowd and this is where, yeah, he found the fan dressed as Dusty Rhodes and what a, what an outfit. This guy went all out for that particular project. And starting things off is Adam Cole and Frankie Kazarian. Uh, This was a red hot reaction for Cole. And when they did the, the, the Adam Cole chant, Oh my God, dude, it was, it was insane how loud this was. I wish they had a decibel meter in this arena. It was nuts. I was talking to a friend of mine who was there and it was just, it just sounded like it was crazy in there. Yeah. Just the fact that they had like the CM Punk entrance and the Adam Cole entrance back to back, like these are two of the top guys you want to see. And just like that, one, two punch, like the crowd was already on a high. And then you hear Adam Cole's music and it's like, boom, that, that was perfect. A perfect way to start the show. Uh, so we got punk on commentary for, I would say almost three quarters of the show before they did the angle with him. Uh, I thought he was great on commentary, like very analytical and speaking like a wrestler would that's out there that's scouting. And one thing was painfully obvious, John, and that was how this guy has been following this product. Like he was bringing up storyline elements in this. He noted like the elite retiring Christopher Daniels. Like it's very clear that this guy is up on the product and up on these performers. I I thought he did a very good job on commentary. And this was the first time uh, that I thought a four man booth worked in AEW. Like you got four very distinct perspectives and I didn't feel them stepping on each other. That I think does happen a lot on Rampage. 
Right. Even like when JR mentioned to CM Punk, like he just assumes that he knew him. He knew Adam Cole and CM Punk said it was like, actually, no, we never really crossed paths. But he made the point of saying how he like left footprints for him. Like he basically allowed Adam Cole to become who he is because of what he did first in Ring of Honor. So that was a pretty cool uh, touch there that they actually didn't never interacted with each other, but they definitely have a lot of um, similarities. So Kazarian got dumped to the floor and it looked like he smashed his face on the way down here. This did not look pretty. Um, Kazarian then does a submission where he crosses the wrists and then put pressure on the neck and Cole just up kicks his way free. He hit an Ushiguroshi and then he does the sweet chin music setup out of the corner, which gets stopped. The Panama sunrise is countered with an Alabama slam and Cole comes back another Ushiguroshi for a near fall fakes out Kazarian from the edge of the apron on the leg drop and hits the Panama sunrise and last shot for the win in eight minutes and five seconds. And my God, this crowd, we talk about Malachi black that this crowd just wants to cheer. It's like times a hundred for Adam Cole. Like they just love this guy, but this was, you know, a pretty entertaining opening match. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a perfect match to start with. Great opponent with Kazarian there. Just Adam Cole just felt like a brand new guy. Like we just saw this guy on TV a couple of weeks ago on a different show. And he feels like Adam Cole 2.0. Like he's got the new music. He's got the new jacket, the new gear. Uh, everything about him just felt so refreshed. Like just like literally jumping from another show can totally reinvent some, uh, somebody. But the match itself was pretty good. It's probably one of my favorite matches on this show. Um, there was one spot where like CM Punk was talking about how like the aprons are different in AEW. Like they're, they're harder than all the other wrestling organizations. So I didn't realize that was a thing. Like I guess their aprons are the hardest aprons in wrestling. Yeah. Punk's been on the phone calling up all the promotions, uh, asking them about their, their apron capacity. Uh, so Cole gets on the microphone, Hope is a dangerous thing and the locker room hopes that they can keep up with the elite. It's not going to happen. And since I've come here, there's three guys that have gotten under my skin, Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, and Christian Cage. And he challenges them to Rampage Grand Slam next week against the Young Bucks and himself. The Super Click is back. And this was our first announcement of Rampage Grand Slam, which will be the two-hour edition of Rampage next Friday night. Yeah, I didn't expect that, but it was it was good to hear that because like I was kind of worried, like, am I even gonna stay for Rampage? Like who knows what they're gonna do? But they definitely gave me more than enough reasons to stick around and, and stay for Rampage as well. So my question, John, uh, I believe I had been saying this from week one of Rampage, is that when are they gonna start dangling two hours of Rampage? This feels like our first test, and it's probably gonna do a tremendous number with CM Punk, Adam Cole, and the Bucks all wrestling. And I think it only is going to beg the question that if this thing does well, A, is how often they go to this experiment of two hours before the question is, does it go permanently to two hours? And I think if, if yeah. TNT, TBS are willing to up the, the amount, I think they will move to two. And that's, it's ambitious. I like the fact that Rampage is 60 minutes. I enjoy it in that 60 minute format, but I mean, that's the game is produce content for as much money as possible. And to me, this was inevitable if this show was a hit and it's been a hit out of the gate. Yeah, I thought the same thing. If this if this show does really good numbers, they're just going to be like, well, we'll make it two hours every week or every other week and just go with that. Um, I'm sorry for you and way (laughs) about that. But I feel like that's just it's going to ultimately come to that. Yeah, I was already looking at that weekend because it's you know, we've got the well, the usual insanity of a, of a Friday night. So we're tacking on an hour. It's, there's a G1 Friday and Sunday. There is a UFC pay-per-view that Saturday. And Extreme Rules is thrown in there as well. So that, that is a weekend that is uh, rather daunting as we are uh, 10 days out. Jeez. There's a video feature for the Lucha Brothers who will defend the tag titles against the Butcher and the Blade this Friday on Rampage. So the Butcher back and getting a, a title shot. Tony Schiavone is with Sammy Guevara and Fuego del Sol, who has a new car that he has just bought, but he would trade all of this away for a chance to be TNT champion. And Sammy Guevara says, is that a challenge? And Fuego says, yes, I will put my car on the line for a shot against Miro. And CM Punk comes back and says, I got to teach these guys. It's like, yeah, you're right. Because this guy's out of his mind. He's gonna ris- he's gonna lose his car, isn't he, John? This was so dumb. Like just this is, from this a- is gonna be like Tori Wilson with her car in two thousand four <laughs> with the Big Show. 
For, I was like, Sammy, first of all, Sammy's a terrible friend. Why are you allowing him to do this? This guy just, you know, and it's funny because I just heard him on the AEW Restricted Podcast and he's talking about how he like got his first paycheck and he's saving his money for his kids to go bring him to Disney World and now he just took this money. His and, family, you know, not Fuego. <laughs> he's going to spend Fuego's money and watch him just burn. Geez, I was like shocked. But yeah, it's going to end up with, um, my, my prediction is that uh, Miro, what is this on Rampage? Miro's going to drive off with the car and then we're going to like, go to the other side and we're going to see uh, one CJ Perry sitting in the, in the passenger seat and that they're going to drive off together in the sunset. Okay. That's not a bad visual, but I, my thought was that Miro's going to win this and we are going to see Miro destroy this car. Mm. And maybe it's because I just watched that big show angle that that's uh, fresh in my mind, but <laughs> Miro just destroying this car of Fuego del Sol's, uh, that, that could be entertaining. Yeah, if it was WWE, we'd just get a toy set right after of uh, Miro destroying the black car. Or the match wouldn't happen on Friday. <laughs> MJF and Wardlow come out, and MJF, who just feels like he's at um, an even higher level now to the, this audience. And this, this has become very apparent with these AEW audiences. And that is, I believe, in a lot of other places, but especially in WWE, MJF would almost be a baby face by now because I think people would just, they're so entertained by this guy that they would start to be getting behind him. This audience, like you've been there, John, like they, they know what their role is and who these characters are trying to portray and what kind of reaction is going to get them to that goal. And it's evident with MJF. It's evident with a lot, like they know who to boo and who to cheer. And I don't, the only exceptions we have seen is like a Malachi black and an Adam Cole so far, but I think in time that will adjust too. And when that Cody Malachi black match happens next week, I, I think you will get a fairly pro Cody crowd, but we'll see. Cody is sometimes half and half, but by and large, like this is an audience that I think they, they understand what their role is. No, for sure. And I definitely felt that at all out. Like when they were booing the young bucks, like, you know, these are the guys that you're pretty much are here for and you're cheering on the Lucha brothers. Like I was like, okay, this crowd knows exactly what their role is exactly. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with that. So MJF just comes out tons of heat and he mocks crying Brian from last week. Great nickname. <laughs> he calls New Jersey, the armpit of America and they start booing, and they're chanting asshole. He brings up Bruce Lee, Taylor Ham, and their godforsaken hockey team that all suck just uh, Bruce, as... Bruce Springsteen, not Bruce Lee. Did I say Bruce Lee? I yeah. said Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I do have Bruce Springsteen written here. Um, they all suck just as hard as their Jersey Shore skanks. So they start chanting, shut the fuck up. MJF then announces that he is a religious man and he wants to have a conversation with the late Brian Pillman. I was like, oh my God. So he looks up into the sky, but then says, let's be honest and looks down and starts yelling at Brian Pillman. He says he's a fan, that Pillman is a legend, but your widow created the worst excuse for a second generation wrestler in Brian Jr. He insults Queens, New York, He's going to massacre Brian Jr. next week. And then Pillman's music plays and he comes out wielding a chair. Uh, but Wardlow, he's gone up the ramp of preparing for Pillman, who sneaks into the ring and then clears out the ring from both of them, including Wardlow, who he sends over the top with this low bridge and uh, Pillman standing tall here. Yeah, I honestly, I mean, I shouldn't feel bad for New Jersey, but I feel like all night long, they were just like, Everybody was hating on New Jersey. It's like, no, you guys aren't going to get anything tonight. Everything's going to be in New York next week. So just like appreciate what you have right now. And it's, I felt bad for everybody that went there. That's not going to New York. Um, but the actual segment was actually good. And I, I like these two guys working with each other. I remember they were working with each other in MLW back when uh, Pillman and uh, right. Teddy Hart, they lost the tag titles to MJF and Richard Holiday. It was pretty cool to see like a, a, a feud from a different company kind of take its place over here. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this whole thing. Um, I, I I was fearing where he was going when he was like, oh, you're not it up could there. Have go- down it here. could have gone so far worse, uh, or just in terms of like um, content um, that they really didn't approach. But man, he just had like post Jericho feud, like he is just, you give him a microphone and he's just, He's just firing on all cylinders at, at the moment. Um, I, just, this... I, I felt like the, the injury that came up after with JR and Brian Pillman was a little bit like weird placement. Like, wow, like they, they went right to it after showing this angle. It didn't really feel right to me. I don't know. 
Yeah, it's like we went from the live segment to a taped interview from like earlier. So it's like we're going back. I I understand what you mean. Like it was a bit of a bit bit of like almost felt like a like a jump that was going back in time here. So JR talks about getting the call from Brian's father 28 years ago telling him about the birth of his son and that he was embarrassed for Brian and his dad last week and says for the family. Brian, we need to see MJF get his ass whipped. So no, n- nothing impartial here from Jim Ross. Pillman feels like he let his dad down. He fought for his life while MJF had the upbringing he had. Mine was feral. And you're stepping in the ring with a Pillman. And they go back to commentary and CM Punk says, you know what? I like MJF. I like all these mind games. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing this next week because I think MJF has to win, but man, they have just built up so much that like Pillman, like he almost has to win this. Like they've made this an intriguing match. Um, and and maybe you just go and you put Pillman over with the, with the idea that MJF can spare one, but it's, um, it's an interesting match of how you pull this off because MJF has just been so strong in the lead up to this. And it's just painted Pillman in this corner that uh, he needs to have, he obviously has to have a huge performance next week. It's a, it's an enormous match for his career. Do you think that this is possibly like them breaking up the, um, the tag team, the, the blondes, the blondes? The blondes and just putting Pillman as a solo? Um, I, th- I think that they're maybe at that, that point with, with Pillman. Um, there, this is certainly a lot of spotlight on him. It's, it's also not uncommon in AEW that we see this where someone gets isolated and gets that, that big push. And then it's like, overall, Brian Pillman is going to benefit from this, but then maybe he takes a step back. You go back to the tag team, but from the grand scheme of things, it's still a net positive for, for Pillman being in this program. And that seems to be like kind of the booking style. It's that, you know, you have your top guys that are always going to be positioned kind of the the front line, but then it's your middle of the pack where they, they do move forward, but then they're kind of forgotten about for a bit or just kind of more on the back burner. So that will be notable kind of the the follow-up here. If he goes right back to the tag team or they shoot some big angle next week too. Alex Marvez is with Jurassic express and Christian cage and Christian cage. uh, I know that they are, uh, they are checking for your, vaccine passports but i hope next week they check christian's bag and his luggage for the daggers that he brought in to the prudential center on wednesday night jungle boy says this just sounds so tame as i'm recapping it before we get the cage i've got better friends and better hair than you adam cage just cuts him off he's like let me take this over jungle boy he says that cole does have some great friends who use their evp status to throw a lifeline and drag Cole's sorry ass out of developmental. We accept your challenge. And since you're used to losing the Wednesday night wars, you better add Friday nights to that list too. Uh, This was like a a great promo was very unsuspecting that it was Christian, that this would come from like, this was very out of left field from a fairly politically neutral Jay Riso. Yeah. this like threw me off. I'm I'm picturing like after this was done, like Beth Phoenix just gave him a call. I was like, dude, well, why'd you do that for? Like, was that necessary? Like, that's what I'm picturing right now. But um, yeah, like I, I every time I see Christian and Jungle Boy, I keep thinking Christian's gonna turn on him. Like he's always cutting him off. He's always like kind of like trying to take the spotlight away from from Jungle Boy. I just feel like it's gonna lead to that eventually. Just Christian just kind of being sick of the the jungle jungle man, the Jurassic Express, and just turning on him. This is going to be, I mean, we can say this about a lot of the, the lineup for next Wednesday. Uh, this will be on the Friday, but being taped Wednesday, uh, this is going to be an outstanding match. Yeah, for sure. And given that's the two hours, they're probably going to get like this under normal circumstances on a rampage might get rushed. I don't think that will be the case next week. Right. FTR against Dante Martin and Matt Seidel. Uh, FTR are still wearing like the Bobby Eaton Midnight Express tribute trunks, which is a good look for them. Mm. Uh, they do a combination, uh, Dante and Matt Seidel hit a combination dive off the middle rope and apron to the floor. They go through the break, uh, have the heat on Matt, Matt Seidel. Dante gets the tag and just goes wild here. He gets several covers on Wheeler. He avoids the big rig and then leaps over cash into a sunset flip onto Dax. Uh, then Dante gets flipped, lands on his feet. And on the second attempt, they hit the big rig for the win in nine minutes and a second. 
I just always enjoy watching Dante Martin. He's been like one of the all-stars in the last couple months on AW Dark and whenever he's on Dynamite or Rampage. The one thing I, I do have to admit AW does really well is when a tag team partner gets injured. They don't just shelf the other guy. We see Dante Martin ever since Darius got injured. We've been seeing the Blade. We've been seeing uh, Bear Boulder. So it's like they give these guys the opportunity to just go out there and wrestle, even if their partner is not there. And Dante is definitely like uh, proving this. And there's a cool little tag team with him and Matt Side. I think it might be one of the first or second times they teamed up. But it was definitely um, to put FTR over in here. But it was a, it was a nice little match. I, I thought Dante and Matt was like a nice combination here, and it was a very good television win here for FTR. Enjoyable tag match. And then CM Punk brings up the Suzuki incident and explains Minoru's history and how he felt slighted that his theme was cut off last week. So he's coming for payback. Uh, This was a very, just a very intuitive look at AEW's philosophy of how they took what was clearly like a, a big negative last week. And they leaned into like this pretty much online meme and made it work for them in, in a weird way. I liked the way that they just took what was handed to them and tried to make a positive out of it. Yeah. It was like, I think total like accident. Like I don't think they meant to, you know, cut out his music last week, but then I don't think at all. Yeah. But then they obviously had a life of its own. Like you said, the whole memes came out and everything and they just, they were teasing it like all week long. I think CM Punk even said like, I'm going to, I'm going to address the Suzuki incident. And that's like so smart to do that. Like to say down the internet where this whole thing is birthed. Um, and it was great just, just to see him like just address it. And it's like something so topical. Like it just happened, obviously. And it's just it's so cool to see a company do that. It's also a cool wink to your audience that even like these, these like little small things that kind of grew over the last couple of days, it's like they are monitoring and they're paying attention. And it just feels like we are on the level of our fan base. We're not, you know, in some, you know, isolated area where we're not paying attention to this stuff. I just thought it was like a cool nod towards it. And they were able to take something and, and, and make it a positive for them. So Suzuki and Archer, there's a video package calling it unfair that Moxley chose his hometown to have the match with Suzuki. And that will change in New York city. Uh, We got new Japan footage here and they're going to have a tag match at Arthur Ashe stadium. Now, correct me if I missed this. Did they, announced this for either of the nights because i didn't notice this in the rundown later i don't think so um i was under the impression that it was on grand slam the dynamite because i'm pretty sure when eddie kingston did the promo on dark it didn't air on tv but from what i read i thought he had mentioned having a match on dynamite i'm pretty sure he did too it was just when they were going through the matches for next week i didn't notice this tag but i'm did they even they also mentioned earlier in the show, Britt Baker and Ruby Soho. Did they mention that? In they the they did mention okay. that in the rundown. Yeah, okay, they did. Good. The lights go out and out comes Malachi Black. This entrance is phenomenal. Like it's just, it's just tr- tremendous. The song works so well. They do like these dips to black and then he's changing his position from the aisle to the turnbuckle and then he's cross-legged in the ring. It's an excellent entrance. He asks the members of the House of Black to stand up. We have an enemy in our midst and who is that enemy why it's the star of clerks too and a judge on go big show it's rosario dawson there in the front row with a nightmare family jacket on <laughs> this was just amazing you know for the for the for the one time that scrump doesn't sit front row he's a huge clerks two fan i think he would have marked out if he saw rosario there but um yeah, that, I, I didn't expect this, but then I kind of clicked like, okay, yeah, she's one of the judges on the Go Big Show. But she had the Nightmare Family jacket and everything. She's one of the, she's one of the family members. Well, you know, Scrump, for this, this episode of Dynamite, he wasn't even supposed to be there that day. He picked the <laughs> wrong day off. Dawson jumps the rail. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Cody Rhodes doesn't walk from the back. He's like coming through from like the concession area. He was like getting some popcorn. <laughs> and he comes out in the loudest red suit you could imagine. And Rosario Dawson jumps onto Malachi Black's back. Cody then fights Black. They had a pretty intense brawl, like into the crowd and all the way up the up the ramp or up the steps. Drinks are throwing. Um, so th- this was Cody's return. It was a very bizarre return, but uh, setting up our match for Wednesday. Yeah, I, I was um, the blown opportunity here. They should have cut to Rosario Dawson during the FTR match so they can chant uh, which one's Dawson. Which one's a Oh, match. <laughs> man, that's, that's pretty funny, actually. I thought when Malachi Black came out for a split second, I thought it was Cody. Because I looked down at, like, his pants and his shoes. I'm like, is this Cody, like, dressing up as uh, Malachi to swerve it? But I had a feeling that he was going to show his face one way or another. But no, he like you said, he came up from the concession stand. And, uh, yeah, they're probably still rolling. I thought they're going to run into um, 
the end with Eddie Kingston and John Moxley. I thought they're going to run into Cody because they never went back to this. It just kind of brawled and kind of took their way out of there. This, this crowd got to see half the AEW roster up close and personal tonight. So Anna J and the bunny have a feature bunny attacked Anna J on dark and is threatening to drop her down the rabbit hole on rampage, which is not a literal stipulation, but a, a veiled threat. So Marvez speaks with the Dark Order. Everyone's arguing. Evil Uno offers to lead. Alex Reynolds shows up. He says, fuck you. Reynolds says, I left Evil Uno. I'm here for Anna. They continue arguing. Anna J doesn't want to have anything to do with any of them except for Ty Conti and the two women leave. Yeah, I've been following this Dark Order dissension very closely on dark and dark elevation it even got to a point where evil uno and and alan five angels even had a match then alex reynolds disappeared and now he's back i think this is going to eventually lead to rochester I, my first thought was even though he's not contractually able to from back then maybe now he is but my first thought was they have to do something in rochester it has to be like the show and it has i think it's going to involve bray wyatt like it nobody else makes sense to get them back on the same track even if it's like not him physically there maybe have some sort of like um, mention to him about Bray Wyatt on the screen or something or some mysterious person talking but I feel like that's going to be the ultimate um, way for him to get back together yeah that shows in two weeks and I, I just I can't imagine that show without having kind of that you know a a Brody Lee type of theme to that night and th- that would be a night to kind of wherever this this story is going whether it's their reunion a return of hangman page. I mean, there's, there's different ways you could you can certainly go about that, but I think everyone's looking at Rochester for the payoff to this. Dan Lambert is in the ring with the men of the year, junior Dos Santos, Andre Arlovsky, and he's brought Kayla Harrison, Austin Vanderford and page Van Zant. meaning yes, everybody. It's our third page in AEW. <laughs> I, I thought this was AW 2.0 at first. I'm like, who are all these like new faces here? I've like, never <laughs> yeah. seen them before. I was like, oh, that's Paige Van Zandt. But yeah, another page, right? Like that's all we need right now. Yes, we, we have the page, page, and page with Cage and Cage so far now in AW. Lambert just cuts another big Dan Lambert promo. He says, you can tell your, your fan base based on the merchandise. And here it's selling men's small and women's XL shirts. Those are the shirts that they sell here. <laughs> he makes fun of all the crazy stunts these guys do and then kick out at two. He's just running down everybody. There's a lot of heat for this. And the uh, inner circle comes out, or I should say Jericho and Jake Hager come out to Judas and you get Dan Lambert. Turn that shit off. <laughs> I don't even know the words. They turn the music off. And I don't know if they expected this to happen or not, but it couldn't have worked out better where the audience finishes the song. Do you think, do you think they, they would have had the foresight to think that this, that kind of spot would happen? Because I think that's a lot of faith in your audience and they obviously came through here. Right. No, I probably think it was just like a coincidence and obviously like they show and prove so they can trust their audience to do things like this. Yes. Just don't, don't, don't have a, a, uh, electric guitar blast oh my god competing that, you know, with them that just, just so, let them go the audience will take care oh, of it. that was so weird because i really wanted to sing it and i see people around me that really wanted to sing it at all out we just didn't know what to do because it was so thrown off and he like went to the chorus too quick and everything mm-hmm. was the, the so idea of it was fine it's just the execution was brutal yeah um but th- this this was a cool moment on the show jericho then starts singing i'm a fat faced dipshit yeah 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 and this crowd, dude, the crowd just eats this stuff up. I, this had to have been a record for the amount of time shit was said on an AEW broadcast, which I don't imagine the record was too low a number previously, but tonight had to have been the new record. Oh, what, what, um, what bitches to WWE piece of shit is to AEW. I feel like yeah, you it say was, that it all was, the time. Yeah, I, I think they've, it's just you're kind of numb to the word now that it kind of loses any kind of impact because you just had so many promos relying on it. Um, Lambert says... Jericho manipulates this audience so that they can spend their allowance their parents give them on his book of the month club and Fozzie tickets, which I'll tell you that Jericho book was not cheap. It was probably several weeks of allowance to save up for that one. (laughs) Jericho asks in regards to American top team, which one of you is on top? And again, dude, this crowd, like they just got into every single line. They start chanting, which who's on top. I couldn't like, you could have come up with any line. And this crowd was going to just gravitate towards it. It was insane. They could not lose here. He brings up that you can't intimidate us. Jake Hager is undefeated. 
And then he brings up his, his SummerSlam 2016 altercation with Brock Lesnar, the 2003 fight with Bill Goldberg, uh, and says, those guys didn't kill me. So how about we come down there and knock your chipmunk buck teeth down your effing throat? And Lambert makes the match with the men of the year against Jericho and Hager, the inner circle jerk. But it's going to happen in a real city. Not a shithole like New Jersey. Even, dude, everyone was feeling bad for New Jersey by this point. Oh, was, poor, I, poor I, I've gone to New Jersey. I, I had an awful stay once in New Jersey, but God, like, I, I would never uh, harp such, such ill will towards this city that, that showed up and sold this building out for you. And they just, uh, man, took every shot imaginable. So next week, the match will take place in a real city in the Big Apple. And then Jericho calls Scorpio Sky a pussy. And there is no escape from New York for you guys. Nice little line there. I, I love Dan Lambert. He's one of my favorite parts of MLW. I was so happy to see him on AEW do the same thing. Um, at one point, CM Punk, uh, he compared Dan Lambert to Bobby DeBrain Heenan if he had a wardrobe full of affliction. That was, that was hilarious. A line. That was a really um, good line. But, like, I didn't expect Jericho to come out. Like, I didn't know where they're going to go with this whole men of the year thing. But it kind of makes sense, obviously, with, with Jake Hager and the MMA background. Um, do you think that we're going to see, like, all these MMA fighters have some sort of involvement next week. I I'm very curious because in this one, the only, I, I don't know if, if you're going to have all these people back next week, it does feel like, I, I think Jericho, ever since they teased the Tyson uh, match that they were going to do, I'm sure he's had the idea of working with like a non wrestler. And if Tyson isn't around, like your, your pick would probably be, like a junior Dos Santos, just because Arlovsky is under a UFC deal. And I just don't see him getting the clearance to do anything. Um, but yeah, I can see an angle coming out of this next week in Jericho, maybe wanting to, to work with one of these guys. I would love to see like a King Mo come over here and do some sort of program with like a Jericho and Jake Hager. Cause him and him and Dan Lambert definitely had a good, good thing going in MLW. Yeah. Uh, and interesting as well to see Paige Van Zant here, who was someone like you know, had talks with WWE a number of years back and has always kind of held the door open that she would be, you know, at the right time would consider doing pro wrestling. And, you know, she's doing like, like bare knuckle, bare knuckle now, and she's not with UFC any longer. It's kind of interesting. Like she is a very marketable individual. And if I was a pro wrestling company, if she was interested, I mean, she would be someone that jumps out and Kayla Harrison was here as well. Yep. So it was interesting to see the, uh, the setup here. The gun club. Finally. Why gun club? Why? Billy says no one was more disrespected in AW than the three of them. He notes that in all the different combinations of him and his sons, we are undefeated. And anyone that has a problem, just say when. And I didn't hear anyone say when. But the question yeah. is, John, when will we get I was, I was the Billy fearing- Gunn Paul White showdown? I was fearing they're going to announce it for uh, for Queens. I really thought we were going to get like a Billy Gunn, Paul White, uh, you know, Shogun matchup uh, in Queens. And luckily they haven't announced that yet. I mean, they're probably announcing it now as we're speaking, but that's what I thought they were going to go with. Um, but we're obviously going to get that match, right? Whether it be a three-on-one, a one-on-one, or maybe Paul White gets some help. He could get, uh, you know, Mark Henry and Shaq to <laughs> team up with him and defeat the, the undefeated gun club, the team that nobody can beat. He needs to go ahead and gather the uh, Shaq and Mark Henry to help him. I, I will say for, for all of this, I mean, this, this was the turn no one was asking for, but this is a better role for the gun club as heels. Oh yeah, for sure. Jade Cargill versus Layla Hirsch, who with Hirsch, they noted originally from Russia, but is billed from Hillsborough, New Jersey. So finally, New Jersey, they're like, oh, <laughs> AW, they're not, they, they won't be a Jersey girl here, here in our hometown. There's no way. So Hirsch, uh, Layla Hirsch looked great in this match. Uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with her every time out. Uh, she looked very good on the, uh, on the NWA show recently. Um, she takes out Mark Sterling with a dive and then goes for an arm bar, but Cargill slams her way free. They go through the break. Hirsch has a bridging German for a two count, hits a low pay, running knee strike for a two count, and the announcers are putting this over. This is the most competitive match Jade Cargill has been involved in. But it ends when Hirsch misses the moonsault off the top Jade hits her with a bicycle kick and hits jaded in six minutes and eight seconds. But uh, they gave most of this match to Hirsch and Cargill winning. Like I, I thought this was like the right way to, to book this and Jade Cargill, the idea that, you know, they are upping the competition and they're, you know, put her out here for six minutes. 
Yeah, and they did a great job yesterday at the um, the AW Dark show, the first one from Universal Studios. Like, the whole show was bookmarked about Jade and, uh, and uh, Layla Hirsch. They started the show with a promo. They both had matches where, like, Jade fought somebody on Helica Risk, who's about the same size as Layla Hirsch, and then Layla Hirsch fought Kylan King, who's about the same size as Jade Cargo. So that was a cool little, like, thing that they did on Dark just to kind of hype this up. Um, but, yeah. That's, was, that's really smart. Like, that's yeah. a great way to use Dark, that a match that's not, like, your big match, but you dedicate a show to making it feel like a big match. Yeah, and I know Layla was the only one New Jersey representation on here, but on Dark, they definitely teased something between Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela, and that's interesting because they're both from Jersey as well. So I'm not sure if they taped something for the Rampage coming up this Friday, but I know they've been having a feud for a while, and that could be like their blow-off match. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Janela and Sonny Kiss representing Jersey this Friday. I know jo- Joey Janela has the new muscle with him with uh, Kayla Rossi, so I can see them doing something for Friday. But yeah, they, 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 they did do uh, a match with them for okay. Rampage. As Good. I, uh, I kind of figured. I mean, you can't have a Jersey show and not have like some GCW Joey Janela representation on it. Next, we go to Andrade, who says he's always one step ahead. He never gave the order to interrupt the match last week. And Jose, the spokesman, informed him that Chavo told him to do so. And Andrade says Chavo is not the boss. And I can beat Pac or anyone, whenever I want. So it looks like Chavo's done. That's what it feels like. And poor Jose, justice for Jose. He didn't do anything wrong. He was just taking orders from Chavo. Why, you know, why, why get rid of the interpreter now? Like now Andrade's all by himself for the time being. He's gone through, what, three, four different managers at this point? Yeah, Vicky, Vicky was short-lived. Chavo was not much longer. So the door is now wide open. Taz walks up to CM Punk on commentary. <laughs> And you just hear Punk's side here because he's on the, the headset. I'm not taking your job. And it's just like a great, like Taz being pissed off that this guy's trying to bump him out. And he stands up to Taz and Hook. And he gets into Hook's face when Hobbs jumps Punk from behind. Punk fires back with punches. And then Hook locks on the dragon sleeper and gets physical. And they clear the desk. Hobbs goes to choke slam punk and the table does not break. This looked brutal. Welcome back to pro wrestling for CM Punk. <laughs> yeah. My first thought was, is he okay? Like whenever you don't see a table break, you're just like, Oh, you kind of cringe. I was a little like, like confused, not confused with this, but because obviously we're doing the whole team Taz CM Punk thing, but I was like waiting for Ricky Starks to come out. Then I was waiting for Brian Cage to come out. Cause I know they've been teasing something that hasn't happened yet. So I thought we we're going to get like a tag team match. I was expecting like Brian Cage and CM Punk against, Hobbs and Hook. I'm really hoping Hook, you know, has his first wrestling match, but they're probably saving that for the Long Island show in December. They have his debut there because AEW likes to have hometown heroes. But um, yeah, we're gonna get Hobbs and CM Punk, which I think is a big hook for for Rampage. Obviously, the last time they had a really big rating was when CM Punk was there, and now it's the first. They kept promoting it the first time in seven years he's wrestled on TV, so it's definitely gonna be a big draw. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's very evident that they they are going full steam ahead to build up like their television. I mean, that's a huge priority for them. And I think they look at like, this is, we have invested in all these new talents and yeah, we could hold stuff off for, for a pay-per-view, but like we, we want to make significant inroads and ride this momentum for all it's worth. Um, and I can't disagree with that, that decision to, to go that way, but uh, this is pretty loaded next week, like between the Danielson Omega match and putting punk on TV Friday. I thought it was a very smart move to split them between shows. Do you think there's any chance they put Hobbs over? Because obviously AEW has been getting a little bit of criticism recently, um, you know, not promoting a lot of their, their African-American talent. I think this would be a huge spot for Hobbs to just destroy CM Punk and get the win. And maybe like CM Punk takes a little bit of time off, nothing too crazy, obviously. But I would definitely put Hobbs over. That would be a big statement to end Rampage. I, I, don't, um, I don't dismiss it as a, as a possibility. I'd be reluctant to beat Punk so quick. Um, there, there's also a way you could do this that, that Hobbs – still benefits greatly from this uh, just being like what should be the main event of that. Sh- I, I guess you could go with the six man as well. Either one, it's going to be a pretty big featured match next week, but I don't dismiss it either that if punk's looking at like a longer term program with team Taz, that this is the first match and it builds up to something, something further, but um, it, it would be, yeah, it's, it, it, it's an it's an interesting decision, but beating Punk so early, I, I don't know if I would go that direction, but it's, you know, they built up Hobbs for something big, and this is certainly something big. Darby and Sean Spears have a video. This is from the Road 2 that they put out on Tuesday, and they bring up 
the clip of Sean Spears delivering Darby Allen's first loss in AEW at the very first fight for the fallen, which I had to look this up. It was Sean Spears, Sammy Guevara, and MJF beating Darby Allen, Jimmy Havoc, and Joey Janela. What a bizarre six man to look back on two, two and a half years later. Yeah, even when they showed the clip, there was like a little sighting of, of Jimmy Havoc. And I was like, whoa, I totally forgot he was in this company for a while. But yet I felt like so long ago, like even when they went right to it, it was 2019, Fight for the Fallen. I was like, it looks, looks so different. Like just AW has has made so many changes in two years to make their product like a lot better. And like, it just, it's night and day. I w- want to go back and kind of watch one of the, some of those original shows before dynamite, just to see exactly like what changes they might've made from like a, um, from a, from a visual standpoint. Cause I feel like they've made a lot of progress in two years. Are those up on bleacher report? I think so. I, I don't see why not. I mean, they were all like purchased like regular pay-per-view. So I don't, some of them were free or was that after when they started doing like the free shows? Yeah, see, see, all these ones, like, we don't have Bleacher Report up here, so we would have bought them on Fight, um, as I recall. So right. I would have to double check, but I'd be intrigued to go back and, and see what's available, but I'm pretty sure they would have to be. I don't see why not. So Spears and Darby had their singles match. We had Sting and Tully in the respective corners, and Tully stands in the way of a suicide dive, and then Darby gets his knee clipped on the apron, and this dude just flipped over, like total ass over tea kettle. And Sean Spears wets a towel with water, gets into the ring, and he starts rubbing the face paint off of Darby's face. And Tony, Tony was witnessing like a, like a live mugging. What the hell is going on? You've got JR. It's part of his personality. They were outraged at this, this horrific act. They come back. Spears has Darby in the Scorpion Deathlock, which they note is right in front of Sting. Allen gets to the rope, hits a code red, and then starts hammering on Sean Spears' knee when he gets thrown off the turnbuckle by his chain around his neck. Darby then stops a Death Valley driver on the edge of the apron, snaps Spears off the top rope, and Spears pretty much has to position himself on the steps a little awkwardly and then gets run over with a tope suicida from Darby Allen. This looked insane, absolutely insane. And then Spears was thrown into the ring for the coffin drop. Darby wins in eight seventeen. Yeah, this is a good match. Um, I liked it. Um, They've been hyping it up for a while, obviously, but uh, it, it was kind of cool for them to kind of go back and show that the time that Darby did lose to Spears, even though it was such a long time ago, like it feels like, you know, it just happened. But um, definitely the right person to go over. But obviously this is all building to the, the angle after the match. Yes. Um, if next week's shows were not big enough, they had FTR confront Darby and Sting. Tully hits Sting from behind with a chair. So Sting just fires up grabs Tully before FTR stops Sting and it leads to a spike pile driver on Sting. And then Mm. Tully wipes the face paint off of Sting. Great spot. Great spot. I love that they did it earlier with Darby and then they did it with like dad as well. And then dude, the ultimate heel tactic, Dax Harwood, just like shooting a snot out of his nose onto these two. I mean, just disgusting, man. Benoit used to do that thing. It was always just so foul. Um, and we are going to get Darby and Sting against FTR next week. And I cannot imagine that FTR are not just giddy with the idea of this match. Well, it's funny because like, didn't like uh, Tully T's like fighting Sting or wanted to fight. So when this was happening, I had heard that there was like a picture from maybe it was backstage from Dynamite of Ric Flair and Sting. So my first thought was, oh my God, Ric Flair is going to come out. And they're going to build to a six man with Tully and Flair. That's my first thought. I'm like, please don't let that happen. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Flair is somehow involved with this, especially if like next week Tully gets involved and then we get this in Queens. Like that'll be huge. Have Ric Flair come out in Queens just to like stop Tully. That'll be a humongous moment. I can definitely see that happening. I, I think everyone's expecting it. And it's only a question of where he fits in. Like, I think they've done, it almost could be a red herring with the, the eliminating Chavo. And then you bring him in, in a different kind of role uh, as well. Brian Danielson video from the road to calling the, the elite insecure. And then Tony Schiavone brings him out to the ring and he is confronted by Don Callis and Kenny Omega. And Don calls him the hippie millionaire and a sanctimonious son of a bitch. He said, Oh, what a hard decision it was coming to the number one company in the world that was built on the back of Kenny Omega and says how your decision was based on what's good for the overall industry. And people call me a carny piece of shit. He says, you know what? 
you probably do feel that way. And therefore, you're not a carny, but a mark, just like all these people. Who are you to dictate who gets these title matches? And finally, Danielson just yells, shut up, Don. Danielson tells Kenny, one day, this will be about the title. But now, it's about who is the best and giving the people what they want and lays out the challenge. And this whole arena is chanting yes. And he tells Callus, shut up, you piece of shit. He came here to fight the best bout machine, the god of pro wrestling. But all I see is a guy hanging out with goofy stooges that lets Don Callis talk for him. Kenny hasn't lost his passion. You've lost your balls. And Kenny agrees to the match. And this was another instance of this where this crowd, they did not just go crazy chanting yes. They did not chant for Brian or Omega. They chanted AEW to end this segment. And I thought that was, again, very notable. Um, and it, it's non-title, uh, but happening next Wednesday, probably a lot earlier than people thought. Although I don't think you could dismiss that they would do it. That is the show to do it if you're going to do it on TV. And they're obviously, John, shooting for like what for Dynamite. I think they are, they are shooting for the moon. And I think for Rampage, I think they want to come as close to replicating the first dance as they can. I think it's going to be very hard to hit that first dance number for any Rampage, including next week. But it seems like they are loading up to try. Yeah, when All Out ending, ended, this is the match that I'm like, this needs to happen in Queens. Like, Omega and Brian, please give it to me. So the whole show, I'm just like, please just announce it, announce it at this point. And even when they went ahead and made the match and they still didn't say it was in Queens, I'm just like, over here, like, just make the match for Queens. Um, this whole promo was great. It's still weird hearing Daniel Bryan curse. Like, instead of piece of shit, I'm expecting him to say, like, fertilizer or something. Just because Daniel, it's Brian Danielson. It's just weird. And uh, the only other thing I would have changed is... Uh, when Brian Danielson had his white shirt, which is like the running joke now that this is his shirt, and Kenny Omega came out yeah, with a white yeah. shirt, I, I expected him to funny. say, I expected him to say something along the lines like, "Yeah, and I'm wearing your shirt. Like, what are you gonna do?" So, but uh, this whole segment was great, and I'm just so happy that he finally made the match official. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's gonna be a huge match next week. It's gonna do, I think, a, a, a huge number, and I think the natural outcome is I, I think Danielson should win the match, and that could set up your pay per view. Yep, absolutely. Miro asks why Fuego is bothering, calling him out. You don't put the hand on the stove that's already burned you. I mean, this guy's lines. It's like, it's outstanding. He's got to just be having a notebook that he's just any idea that comes to you. He's going to bash Fuego's brain. Then I'll bash your car and your family will always be grateful to him. Matt Hardy says that Orange Cassidy broke his nose and you owe me a debt that I'm going to collect. You make a mockery out of my business. I will take away everything of yours, starting with your hair, and you will become orange egghead. <laughs> I, I'm like, kind of like this morbid curiosity of what they're going to do with this. Are they going to have a hair versus hair match? Are they really going to like go through with this? I can see Matt Hardy shaving his head. He's, why not? He's done crazier things. Um, but I definitely don't, don't touch any hair on Orange Cassidy. That, that's this whole gimmick right there. You can't, you can't take the man's hair away. Where do you see this happening? I, I would certainly not throw this out there next week. You've got enough. This could be Rochester. This could be the Philadelphia show in two weeks. I think those yeah. are probably your, your candidates. Yeah, I would save it for definitely Rochester. And the, where's Orange Cassidy from? Is he from the Northeast area? I'm not even sure. But I feel like that would be a good like moment for him to have. Um, but I could definitely wait on it. We've got to wait on at least two or three weeks. So Rochester and Philly makes sense. And then the lineup. So next uh, this Friday... On Rampage, we've got the Lucha Brothers against Butcher and the Blade for the tag titles, Anna J against the Bunny, and Miro versus Fuego del Sol for the TNT title, uh, which I understand is the main event on, on Friday. So uh, we will have the spoilers up on the site. We will not uh, put them out for people listening. Dynamite next Wednesday. This is our lineup. Kenny Omega versus Brian Danielson. Cody Rhodes versus Malachi Black. MJF versus Brian Pillman Jr., Britt Baker versus Ruby Soho for the women's title, FTR against Sting and Darby Allen, and CM Punk will have an interview uh, after the angle tonight with Team Taz. Stacked. Stacked lineup yeah. for next Wednesday. I'm over the, over the, over the top excited with this card. It's definitely a pay-per-view caliber. And they'll follow that with uh, Rampage uh, from Arthur Ashe Stadium. So the next Friday night, the two-hour show, they've announced three matches with Adam Cole and the Bucks against Cage, Jungle Boy, and Luchasaurus, Punk against Powerhouse Hobbs, and Jericho and Hager against Men of the Year. And unless I missed it, like, I don't know where they put Moxley and Suzuki against, or, or sorry, Moxley and Kingston against Suzuki and Archer. Uh, I 
it had the, I was under the impression Wednesday, but I guess we will. Uh, I think it makes more sense on Rampage. I feel like like that's a so much lot stuff of stuff they've Wednesday. got on Wednesday. Like yeah. you want Omega and Danielson to have like twenty twenty five. And you're, you are going to have to navigate commercial time there. I mean, two hours sounds like a long time, but it, it eats up quick. Like Cody and Malachi Black, you probably have to do like the big match between those two. I don't think that's going to be another two, three minutes. Um, so yeah, you, you could get away putting that on, on the Friday when you have the extra hour. Main event, John Moxley and Eddie Kingston against 2.0. They went through the break early on. Uh, Daniel Garcia was involved here, getting tossed into the barricade. They double teamed Moxley. Parker came off Lee's back, dropping an elbow on Moxley. And then Moxley fires back with a lariat and makes the big tag to Eddie Kingston. Urican to Jeff Parker, DDT on Lee. And they Moxley comes in, yells in Kingston's face. And that is a signal for the lariat into the half and half and Jeff Parker gets pinned in 636. When they first announced this match, the whole time I'm thinking that like they're doing this match just so CM Punk can make some 2.0 jokes or something like 2.0 is going to destroy the 2.0 sucks or something. I haven't expected them to come out with like ring gear that actually like look like the new NXT logo just to, you know, make fun of it. Because I can't really... believe they didn't touch it at all. Like there was, yeah, nothing. it's an easy nothing. joke. Maybe, maybe right it was there. too easy. Maybe it was like low hanging fruit. That's true. And then cousin Ninare begins to play Minoru Suzuki walks out <laughs> which listen you, you never you never want to wish um pain on somebody but those seven stitches and like the black eye that's there like what a what a just tremendous look for Minoru Suzuki to come out looking furious dude it was like nine fifty nine, <laughs> and I thought they were literally gonna cut it off before the song Me and then too. next week they give it to you i thought for sure they were going to do this Me too. but it's they played it out they, it was like this was listen we we screwed you last week we are not going to do that again this week they gave you the song and then as soon as they got to sing archer yanks kingston moxley takes suzuki and they have this like three minute brawl all over the place Moxley stopped a gotch pile driver on the desk using the microphone. And it was just another wild brawl on a show that had many brawls. And that is how the show concluded. As soon as um, Suzuki came out with the stitches, my first thought was, oh my God, he's going to wrestle Jonathan Gresham in two days and it's going to open right back up, isn't it? That's right. He's got the (laughs) Gresham match on Friday. And I think it's almost a given that there will be blood in that match. Yeah. But it was a good way to end the show. I thought the same thing as you. I'm just like, are they going to like really cut it off? Or are they going to have like Moxie attack him before he gets into the ring? So I figured something was going to happen, but I was, no, they, they paid it off. We got our, our Suzuki incident is finally uh, resolved. They gave, they gave you the song and you'll get it again next week with 19,000 people. So it's going to be quite the, quite the spectacle to be in the crowd for John. You, you've got to be really amped for the show next week. Yeah. I'm, Overly excited. Um, at the All Out show, I didn't get a chance to to sit next to to Davey because the tickets are so hard to get. So Davey ended up sitting in a separate section. But for this one, me and Davey are there. Brayden's gonna be there, so um, it's gonna be a definitely a fun time with the BDE boys. All right, let's go to some feedback uh, before we sign off, guys. Full disclosure, okay? I, I don't know how this poll system works. Okay, I don't know how Wade does it every week. Twenty nine percent of you gave this show uh, a ten out of ten. Twenty five percent a nine out of ten. Twenty one percent gave it an eight out of ten. I take it. This was a very well-received show. Way will be back next week. He'll figure out the poll system. I give up. Noah from Vaughn writes, whenever we see episodes of wrestling, try to be chaotic for the sake of it. It usually doesn't work. However, tonight was the complete opposite. It was done so well. It felt like the perfect appetizer for the main course and dessert that next week will bring. The matches tonight all were enjoyable and the Dan Lambert Jericho segment was perfect. AEW just keeps the momentum going. I'm curious what your predictions are for the ratings for next week's show, knowing the big matches announced tonight. 11 shits out of 10 tonight. <laughs> that would break the poll system to be 11 out of 10. Um, I think it's, I think next week, um, you know, last week was just over 1.3 million. Their all time viewership uh, is just over 1.4 that the premier did. I think this has a pretty good shot of, of topping it. Um, I'm very curious to see this week. Like when you have momentum, it's like, man, it's, it's very hard to predict because even like a down show, the number might really surprise you because it's not a rating is not uh, equated to quality of show. It's, it's buzz in the product and buzz in the interest for a show. And AEW has a lot of interest in their shows and that is going to peak next week. Uh, So I, I sense very high and I think it's, it's going to threaten, if not beat, I think their, their all-time viewership next week. 
Their all time is 1.4 for Dynamite. I can see this going 1.6, a little over. If they do, that's a big week. It's yep. like this is a this is a very intriguing time when when Raw is hampered by Monday Night Football and you are going to have some very competitive weeks. And next week is certainly going to be one of those. In term, we we always talk about the pacing, John. And I thought last week was a show where it was just so much thrown at you, and there was a lot tonight. There always is going to be in Dynamite. I did see like you know they had a card to build for next week. They actually had two cards to build for next week and it was a lot thrown at you, but I think it like you digested it pretty, pretty well. How did you feel about just how much they threw out and the pacing? No, I agree with that. And that's always been like a, one of the issues for me with dynamite is like the, the crazy fast pacing, but um, even though they gave us a lot, they definitely like did it in a way where it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't too much basically. Um, I think they did a really good job just kind of having each segment kind of breathe before they moved on to the next one. Johnny writes, originally when the show was announced as Blood and Guts last year during Revolution, me and a group of friends immediately agreed to go. But after all the postponements, we decided to sell our tickets. While we were bummed on not going to to the show anymore, we felt that show played better for the TV audience. A lot of talking segments that felt like they were setting up for the bigger show next week. Love Punk on commentary, Adam Cole match, and the FTR match. The main event felt too short, but we got to hear Kazunin Are, so 10 out of 10. My question is, should Kenny lose next week to help Brian get the title shot for full gear, or is having Kenny lose two big matches uh, weakening the impact of Hangman taking the title from Omega? I see, I see the Hangman. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion, too. I see the Hangman thing as a long-term thing. I wouldn't be looking at that immediately. Like I see Danielson as this is his first big match. I think he wins, and I think that should be the full gear match. And Hangman is something that... I think that's off in the distance, but you've got, you've got a big program here with Danielson. That should be the immediate focus. No, I agree. I see no problem with, um, with Omega losing to Brian and doing the match at full gear. And then the next pay-per-view after that, which will be like what I'm guessing at the top of the new year, like January, February, that'd be perfect time for, for Hangman to come. It's a long distance between full gear. Like revolution is like last week of February, early March that they've been doing that. It's like that. That's a big gap when you're talking like three months, pretty much between pay-per-views. Uh, next one here. Good show tonight. I've never understood why Dan Lambert is here. They have never explained why he has the ability to take up time on the show. I don't know who he is. I watched MMA enough to know American top team, but why he's here makes no sense. He hates this company. He's here to bring it down (laughs) on a positive note. The crowd t-shirt game was on point guy up in the stands with a Larry Zabisco shirt and an I'm your poppy shirt. I did see that one, Mm -hmm. Uh, but the best was in the front row in the blue rip shirt in honor of no holds barred. (laughs) Next, we go to Mug and a solid outing that set the table for two massive nights at Arthur Ashe Stadium. Omega Danielson is a pay-per-view level dream match that doesn't need too much time to build, and I like that it doesn't involve the title. Punk's commentary felt like he was getting a lay of the land, and it featured, uh, featured things with Team Taz coming together nicely. What are they going to fill the second hour of Rampage with beyond the three matches advertised? I will say, John, AEW filling shows is not my concern right now. I, I do not worry about them filling... Uh, it's it's fitting so much stuff that they have uh I, I do not worry about them filling two hours of rampage next week yeah they got so many angles they could always just throw in brian cage and ricky starts if they wanted to obviously this tag match pretty much is going to be there with kingston and uh, moxie but yeah they're not gonna have any issues filling that up at all brian from new jersey though nowhere close to newark he notes <laughs> for newark Hot episode tonight, largely used to build up everything in Queens next week. Not to write off tonight's show, as it had a lot of good wrestling and strong promos, even though AEW needs a shit counter as much as Raw and SmackDown needs a bitch counter. I like Punk on commentary and love this confrontation with Team Taz. When Rosario Dawson, of all people, showed up, my first thought wasn't that's Cody's fellow Go Big Show judge, but that's New Jersey Senator Cory Booker's girlfriend. Her own acting career would also take precedence over her ties to Cody. Still a cool moment. All right. And... Scrump writes in, Jay and Silent Bob do exist within the AEW universe. That is a great point. Yeah. Going back to that, that very first episode. Yeah. I was fine with that being the most Kevin Smith connection we got, aside from Chris Jericho. But it looks like Uncle Tony isn't done with the View Askew, View Askew universe. Uncle Tony has done a lot in the last month, but the fact that he had me screaming, Rosario Dawson is attacking Malachi Black during work was not on my 2021 bingo card. Here's hoping we get Ben Affleck now that he's on his comeback tour. Maybe, maybe they'll bring in a uh, recently released talent, uh, Buddy, Buddy Murphy as Buddy Christ. There we go. That works. That's perfect. <laughs> 
Uh, he gives eight. He says, don't know why we spent time designing a Brian shirt when we could have just been marketing basic white shirts as that's the only thing he seems to want to wear. Yes, that's the, from, from Pro I thought Wrestling the same thing. I'm like, he's not even wearing his shirt. Just, just make a white shirt and have a little AEW tag on it. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. I didn't say the selling the white t-shirt as a joke either. There are absolutely people that would buy that shirt. And I think you would have had a sea of white t-shirts next week if they were marketing and selling those. That'd be great. That'd be great. Last word of the night goes to Cash from Ajax. While I love the fact that Big E won the belt on Monday, it's not going to move the needle for the company. Why? Because about 95% of WWE programming each week is trash and has been trash for years, for years now. They put no effort into anything outside of stage design and branding. AEW, on the other hand, tries their absolute best week in, week out to deliver great matches, great stories, great angles, and promos that constantly reward their fans for their time and attention. I understand the negative WWE sentiment, but if you cannot look at this period and see that WWE had like that SmackDown last week, uh, Raw this week, like these to me are the, are the most concrete, like reactionary um, style of shows that, that we've seen, John. Like this to me is the first time we're like we are we are seeing a, a, a very concerted effort to shake things up in WWE. It will at last. I do not know, but I do feel that they like this is a good thing that we are seeing that you are feeling like we have to do things differently. Yeah, a lot of people that I speak to that like, you know, are diehard WWE fans that kind of went over to AEW. One of the, the things they always say is like, hopefully AEW doing this is going to help WWE get better. So now they did something to, you know, it's a baby step or it could be a big step depending on how you take it. But it's definitely a, in the right direction. So I don't see people like why they would complain about this. It's definitely a positive thing. Just kind of like, you know, it's step one, obviously, in a long list of things they need to change. Uh, his question was, are you both tired of happy and humble CM Punk? I cannot wait for the heel turn. Yeah, I mean, it's still still early, right? It's still in the honeymoon phase. So we're going to see this baby face, happy CM Punk for a while. But yeah, when he turns, it's going to be a big turn. It's going to be great. I'll probably do it in Chicago like next year or something. Just have him turn heel in his own city. He's a super baby face right now. Like you don't have to be uh, concerned about that now. But but when the time comes, you, yeah. can, you can certainly pull the trigger. How would you book Hangman's return? Um, do you see Rochester as a possibility, John? For Hangman? I mean... Yeah, it's got to be either him or Bray Wyatt if he's able to do it. I can't see anybody else in that spot. But then what do you do? You just have him reunite, like, Dark Order? Like, who does he fight? Unless he fights, like, Evil Uno, like, just because he's the one that's, like, kind of, like, against everything. I don't know what you do with Hangman just yet. I probably wouldn't bring him back until he's ready to fight Kenny. Like, have that spot where he comes out and he gets face-to-face with Kenny Omega. And his last one is, uh, what more does AEW have to do to hit raw viewership numbers? Uh Overall viewership is going to be really tough because Raw is still, it's, they're very significantly above them in their over 50 audience. That makes a big difference. And female viewership too, which, which skews towards Raw. Um, however, like if you're throwing, I, I do not think that Monday Night Football is going to be the monster. It is uh, every week that we saw this week. I think this was certainly going to be on the high end. Uh, but, you know, you're throwing out a prediction next week of one, 1. 1.6 for Dynamite. Uh, that's that's what Raw did this week. It was just over that that figure. So I think it might be closer than than maybe we we had thought. But it, it's going to depend on the level of competition Raw has with uh, the given NFL game of the week and the absolute top end that that Dynamite can hit. I, I think the eighteen to forty nine battle that's the really intriguing one because that that is a hittable marker for AEW and they slightly edged them out last week. Um, so that to me is the race to watch. Um, if they get close to raw viewership numbers, that's, that's that much more impressive, but the 18 to 49 number that, that means a whole lot. If they're competitive with raw during this season. One thing that I noticed from the SmackDown, um, show that I went to is I feel like your average fan who might go to a SmackDown MSG, a lot of them don't still know about AEW. I heard like two or three conversations where like, friends were trying to tell their friends about AEW and they were like so confused about it or even one time when somebody mentioned Adam Cole and like you just hear like these reactions like I feel like a lot of people that go to the shows obviously we know because we're on you know the internet we follow this stuff but like the average fan who might go to like a Smackdown they might not still be aware of AEW so as far as what they need to do to hit those viewers I don't know I mean they're on TNT they're on a major network like what else can they do to, to promote it I see commercials everywhere I see banners everywhere but it's like your average W fan still might not like it's been two years and they still might not even realize what it is. Well, and you know, you'll probably get a keen sense of this, John, over the next week is that 
you know, you, you did the show in Newark uh, and going into New York last week, like you, you have a lot to brag about if you're AEW with this, this huge, uh, you know, audience that you are attracting, they've got to hit the run, the, the ground running on the media front, get yep. your talent out there and just try and blanket the, the Northeast market and get onto as much media as you can and really pump the fact that, Hey, we are the new kid in town and we got 19,000 people at the show on Wednesday night. It's, it's a big, you know, pat your back kind of moment. And I'm very curious to see what the, the, the appetite is for the non wrestling media in the Northeast to uh, get into the AEW product next week when, when they're holding that big show. Yeah, but I definitely agree with that. I would love to see like AEW like show up like in a hot 97 or one of these radio stations. I'm not sure how that might work because of Peter Rosenberg. There might be a little conflict of interest there, but I would definitely like to hear them like on just the local radios and just kind of like spreading the word in New York itself just to get the buzz going. All right. Well, everybody, it's going to be a, a big set of shows from AEW next week. Mr. Cena will be there in attendance along with uh, Davey and Braden. I understand yep. Braden is they're, making the trip. They're both going. Yep. Well, that, uh, you guys are going to have a great time next week. Uh, but as we say farewell, uh, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to you, John, uh, staying home tonight and doing the show with me. It was great to uh, chat with you to review this show. But for those who want to hear more, the floor is yours, John. You got to talk for more than 15 minutes tonight. So it's like... <laughs> Definitely. Uh, you got, to, you got to stick around for a bit, really, really go deep into all of this. Definitely. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on the show. When, when, you, when you had asked me, I'm looking at my newer tickets and I'm like, wait a minute, do I want to talk about the show with John Pollock or do I want to go there? I clicked refund right then and there. I'm like, nope, I'm staying home and I'm doing this show with John. Um, but thank you again for having me on here. And uh, yeah, just check out my shows like Shine the Dark, like you mentioned, 15 minutes every week talking about AW Dark and uh, Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling Strong, which I've been loving. Um, yeah, just kind of sum it up you know, within 15 minutes every week. And also recently me and B Detroit have been doing um, turning heels every Monday on the up next feed, where we talk about the star show with Stephen Amell and uh, CM Punk who showed up on it. And I think we have three more episodes left of that. And people have pretty much been enjoying that as like a companion piece. We actually were, I was personally inspired for when you and, and way like we talk about glow. Cause it was always mm-hmm. cool to kind of like, listen to people that like wrestling talk about a wrestling show. We thought the same idea, like we might as well do this as well. And it's been getting a pretty good reaction. So definitely been enjoying that. Uh, and also, I'm contractually obligated to promote uh, BD Elite. So after you guys are done listening here, go and check out Davey and Braden talk about AW Dynamite from Newark as well. Yes, check out, check out all of Davey and Braden's fine work that they put up on the Up Next Network. We're all, we're all good friends. And I look forward to uh, hearing some of your live thoughts uh, next week. I'm sure you'll be uh, popping up, chatting about it. And yeah, I think I'm actually going to jump on um, their show, the BDE League, next week. So it'll be two awesome. back-to-back Wednesdays talking about uh, Dynamite. So you'll be hearing me uh, live in the flesh with uh, Brady how will and you do, shows. How will you do like the elevation? Are you going to just go based on the live experience? Are you going to watch the show too after the fact? How are you going <sighs> to tackle that? Probably going to go back and rewatch it. I feel like I get a lot of context from commentary. A lot of times, like Eddie Kingston and Taz, they give me like little sound bites to to use on the show itself. So I definitely going to, I always go back and rewatch the shows, even like MLW, whenever that comes back, I'll definitely go back and watch it, even though I was there at the show. All right. Well, we are going to sign off, folks. Uh, again, MCU Later will be dropping for Post Wrestling Cafe members on Thursday with WH Park, Scrump, and Stank. And then Friday night, I am back with Kate from Montreal for Rewind to SmackDown where we will only have to review three hours of wrestling on Friday night before we get the big four next Friday night. I, I don't know how I could, I could take a permanent four hours on Friday did, night. Did you break the news to way? Like does he even know yet? Or is he still stuck in Mexico? I, I have actually made a conscious effort not to contact way at all this week. And I'm hoping that he's just turned his phone off and then he's going to just get besieged uh, with messages when he turns it on and realizes all that is to come next week, because th- he is coming back at one of the busiest weeks of the year and busiest like seasons of the year. It's uh, it's a lot, but uh, we always manage to find a way. So you can go check out all of our stuff up at postwrestling.com. Give the man a follow. See no evil on Twitter. Always yeah. a great, always a great uh, insight into every wrestling show under the sun and he does it in a very timely fashion which is welcome in these days of so much content to watch so thank you to everybody for joining us live tonight and we will speak with you later on this week